It's really good to be here. Um, as, uh, as George said, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about transporters and transporter modulation of excitatory synaptic signaling. Um, my lab has been uh, working on neurotransmitter transport, the molecules that mediate uh, reuptake of neurotransmitters in the brain for a long time. And uh, what I want to tell you about today is um, kind of a, an interesting story, at least I think it is. Um, it involves um, kind of circling back to a transporter that was cloned from human brain about 20 years ago by uh, my colleagues at, at the Volum Institute, Susan Amara and Jeff Ariza. And our collaboration at that time involved um, uh, characterizing this, this uh, SLC1 transport protein, and I'll tell you in a minute what SLC1 transporters are. Uh, but it, but we, that, that transporter and that project kind of lay dormant for many years, and, we've, and I'm going to tell you today about a story where we've come back to it and we found some things that I think are very interesting and uh, potentially very important about its role in brain development and in learning and memory and in um, and, and, and as it turns out, some important and kind of uh, highly prevalent human mutations. So SLC1 transporters uh, are members of, of a family of solute carriers. So the, the nomenclature now for membrane transporters, which make up a huge fraction of the genes in, uh, expressed in mammals, are, uh, are uh, numbered one through approximately 45, I think, now. So um, the SLC1 transporters, there are seven members, there are seven genes in this family expressed in, in mammals. And it turns out five of them are glutamate transporters. And, and from the standpoint of neuroscience, neurobiology, all, virtually all the focus on this family has been on the five genes that encode glutamate transporters because glutamate is the predominant excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. But in addition to the five acidic amino acid transporters, the glutamate transporters, there are two neutral amino acid transporters. And uh, they happen to be n just numbered according to their order of discovery. So four and five are also called um, ASC transporters, which stands for alanine, serine, and cysteine, which is their kind of best characterized substrates. And um, we, we have crystal structures now. Eric Wo's group and, uh, has, has um, solved X-ray crystal structures of the glutamate transporters, and we know they're homotrimeric proteins, and we presume that the neutral amino acid transporters have a similar uh, structural organization. They're actually about equally uh, homologous to each other as to the, to the glutamate transporters. And I'll show you in a minute, there's actually just one amino acid change in these two groups that accounts for the difference in selectivity. So I'm going to just segue for a second to talk about HM, which you all are familiar with as um, probably, well, it's been called the most famous patient in neuroscience. And HM uh, was, uh, became, became a subject of a decades-long study following a, 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 um, a radical surgery that he underwent as a young man to alleviate intractable epilepsy. And in that surgery, his bilateral uh, lobes of his temporal cortex were removed, including his hippocampus. And following that surgery, his, his, uh, his memory was completely, completely uh, ablated. He had, he had no anterograde, uh, he had complete anterograde uh, uh, amnesia. He could remember things in the past, but he couldn't form new memories. And I'm only showing this, this was his, this was his uh, um, obituary that appeared in the New York Times about uh, eight years ago. Um, but his, his case and subsequent, lots of subsequent research focused neuroscience um, research on memory and learning and memory on the, on the hippocampus. And um, what I'm going to do today is talk to you a little bit about the hippocampus and the role of these transporters in the hippocampus and in synaptic transmission in the hippocampus. And um, the hippocampus has been um, a subject of intense 
study to understand how learning and memory works and how the molecular and cellular processes that underlie learning and memory work, long-term potentiation. Um, and this is, of course, a, uh, a, a mouse brain cut away showing the hippocampus. And if we focus in on this small region here and look at, um, look at some fluorescent images of sparsely labeled principal neurons in this layer called the, the CA1, um, these, these neurons are arranged in this layer, layered organization, and their dendrites extend down and um, they, receive, they receive synaptic inputs from, um, from cell bodies further away uh, in the, in the um, CA1 layer that project up, to, up into, these, uh, into this dendritic layer. So the Schaefer collateral layer releases glutamate onto these neurons and that, and that synapse, the CA1 Schaefer collateral synapse has been an area of intense study for many, many, many years. And so as I said, glutamate is the predominant excitatory transmitter at um, synapses in the brain and in, and in the hippocampus. And this uh, cartoon shows some, some arrangement of some of the relevant molecules involved in synaptic transmission at the Schaefer collateral CA1 synapse. These Schaefer collateral axons from the area CA3 um, project through that layer and they make ampersand synapses on dendrites in CA1 and glutamate's released presynaptically and postsynaptically we have the NMDA and AMPA receptors that mediate the synaptic um, responses and also shown here are some of the glutamate transporters, in particular E2, or excitatory amino acid transporter number two, which is a predominant, prominent, most abundant glutamate transporter in brain, and it's expressed primarily on astrocytes. Um, so what I'm gonna do is tell you a little story uh, that is, is also a new story. What I'm really gonna do is tell you kind of a bipartite story. One is about glutamate transporters, and another is about neutral amino acid transporters. And I'm gonna first go through briefly the uh, glutamate transporter, some, some new data on glutamate transporters role. Now, um, I, I alluded to the hippocampus because it's a, it's a model area to understand learning and memory. And at this point, one of the best models for understanding how that works is the change in synaptic strength that occurs at glutamate synapses. So they, you can think of them as binary, this, this is an oversimplification, but they can change back and forth between a potentiated state and a depotentiated state that, that's been uh, referred to as long-term potentiation or long-term depression. Now, what triggers long-term potentiation is repetitive activation of presynaptic um, axon terminals releasing glutamate onto the postsynaptic uh, spines. And when that happens and there's enough activity in the postsynaptic cell, NMDA receptor activation triggers the movement of AMPA receptors into or out of synapses. And, and that can be bidirectionally uh, regulated. AMPA receptors can, can um, move in and out from intracellular compartments. And when they're, and with the proper uh, the proper frequency and level of presynaptic and postsynaptic activity, this recruitment of AMPA receptors from intracellular stores to the membrane leads to more AMPA receptors being on the postsynaptic surface and a larger postsynaptic response. And that is kind of an oversimplified uh, but a basic description of our present state of understanding of NMDA receptor mediated long-term potentiation. So what does that really look like? If we, if we um, do electrophysiology in an acute slice from a mouse brain, we take a slice, this, this you can see here is infrared DIC optics. You can see the cell bodies of those pyramidal neurons that we were looking at, and dendrites are down here out of the picture. And we have a pipette where we can record activity, electrical activity, postsynaptic activity in response to that glutamate release and we can stimulate those presynaptic nerve terminals to release glutamate and we can record a signal in this case it's a uh, in this case it's actually a, a field excitatory postsynaptic potential that is a depolarization um, that's mediated by 
AMPA receptors. Now, if we, um, if we stimulate the presynaptic neuron with a, high, a high, brief high-frequency pulse or even a theta-frequency stimulus protocol, um, what happens is that there's an increased amplitude of the postsynaptic response. And that's um, almost completely uh, mediated by an increase in the number of AMPA receptors on the postsynaptic um, cell surface. And that, and that potentiation can last for hours. It lasts for hours and actually in vivo recording show it lasts for, for days and weeks. And, uh, and that can be completely blocked by, by using NMDA receptor antagonists. So you're all probably familiar with uh, Morris water maze, which is a behavioral assay that's used to assay spatial memory in mice. And in a, the way this test works, a mouse is put in a, in a pool. And uh, over a period of days, it learns with spatial cues surrounding the pool, it learns the location of a, of a submerged platform, a hidden platform that it tries to find. Uh, and by the seventh day of training, you can see that the, the track that a mouse takes that's been trained every day um, is much shorter than it is when it randomly starts on day one. And if in that kind of a that kind of a protocol, if we do the same thing with mice that have been injected with NMDA receptor blockers, AP5, the mouse is completely incapable of that spatial learning paradigm. And this kind of data and other lots of other data uh, are consistent with uh, this idea that NMDA receptor um, NMDA receptor activity is critical for triggering that AMPA receptor um, localization recruitment to the membrane to, to induce long-term potentiation. So NMDA and AMPA receptors I've been talking about are two different um, types of glutamate receptors. They're both heterotetrameric receptors composed of um, four subunits. They bind glutamate. Um, and the, the cogent, the main difference between NMDA and AMPA receptors uh, that we want to really focus on it's the, the, the special role of NMDA receptors comes from the fact that they, number one, are permeable to calcium when they open, when the channel opens and ions flow. Um, calcium entry through the NMDA receptor triggers a, a cascade of second messenger events that leads to this AMPA receptor recruitment and LTP. Another important part of NMDA receptors that's different from AMPA receptors is that they're blocked by magnesium ions, extracellular magnesium ions, in a manner that the, the magnesium ion enters, partially enters the pore of the receptor, and it senses the voltage field across the membrane. And in order for the magnesium to be unblocked so the channel can conduct calcium, the, the postsynaptic cell has to be depolarized. So there has to be act, postsynaptic activity going on that will allow the magnesium ion to come out and, uh, and then calcium and ions can flow through and lead to uh, LTP. So, in, so these NMDA receptors have been called coincidence detectors because of that fact that they require both postsynaptic activity as well as glutamate release. Now, um, I'm going to talk about reasons why Coincidence detectors are um, important, but, but the story is also a lot more complicated with NMDA receptors. And for one, one reason is that NMDA receptors, unlike AMPA receptors, and others differ in that they bind glutamate to two of the subunits in the tetramer, but there are two additional binding sites for coagonists. Uh, and this, these coagonists are, um, have been identified recently as D-serine or glycine. And it turns out that actually uh, D-serine, which is an unusual D enantiomer of serine, it's found in brain, it's synthesized by, uh, by, uh, by, uh, by um, serine racemase, which actually converts L-serine into D-serine. That uh, occupancy of the receptor by, the, by this coagonist is also required for NMDA receptor signaling to occur. And we'll come back to that in a minute. 
So I'm not going to go through a lot of electrophysiology. I know that mo most of you aren't, aren't electrophysiologists, and I know what it's like to kind of have to look at electrophysiology slides too much. So, but I want to just show you uh, what it, why this is important, this idea of coincident depolarization to a relieve magnesium block. If you give, uh, if we now take a, an electrode and patch onto a pyramidal neuron in the hippocampus and pull it off in an outside out configuration. So we've got glutamate NMDA receptors in outside out and we can give a glutamate pulse, a real brief one millisecond pulse of glutamate. Um, and we, when we do that, we can record the currents that flow through the NMDA receptors. We're blocking all the AMPA receptors in this experiment. So we're just looking at NMDA receptor currents. There's a small current that occurs and uh, when we give, if we give a depolarizing voltage pulse at these different intervals, brief depolarizing voltage pulses from minus 60 to plus 40, what that does is pops the magnesium ion off and it unblocks the channel pore. So we can see what happens immediately if we give a voltage pulse right after the glutamate binds, there's a big current. And if we give pulses later on, that, that ampl the amplitude of that current decrements exponentially with time. And that decrement reflects the fact that the NMDA receptor channel has um, deactivation kinetics, so glutamate binds real rapidly, um, one millisecond pulse of, uh, of, in this case, one millimolar glutamate. It binds and it opens the channel, and then it takes a long time for that to come off and for the channel to go through some other kinetic states that, that cause it to close. But if you, if you look down here, the, the time course of that is actually quite slow. It's on, the, it's on the range of a couple hundred millisecond time constant of decay. And that's much slower than the AMPA receptor mediated signals that occur during a synaptic event where glutamate is released and AMPA receptors open and, and inactivate really rapidly, like within a, a couple of milliseconds. So if we, if we were to superimpose the AMPA receptor response on this, it, you'd see that it, it would be over Ver really before the NMDA receptor response ever even reached its peak. And the fact that the magnesium block uh, is keeping the channel closed tells us that really what, is, what needs to happen is that you have to have another depolarization later after that first initial depolarizing event associated with, with synaptic glutamate release. So when glutamate comes off, the transient of glutamate only lasts a millisecond or two like this in the synapse. The AMPA receptor opens real quickly and it closes real quickly. The NMDA receptor barely has time to open before the AMPA response is over. But it's, it's primed. Even though we don't see it, uh, it's, it's ready to be open and conduct if a depolarizing pulse occurs within this window of time here that uh, the, the, the receptors are, are, are still bound, but not, but not um, open. Yeah, John? Um, what happens if you do equal intervals between your pulses? Is, or is this just to illustrate how long it takes to decay? Yeah, this is just to illustrate the time course of decay. Okay. That's all. Yeah, the, the, the spacing of the pulses is pretty arbitrary. Okay. And, and, the, and the, the pulses themselves don't affect the kinetics of this response. We could do it one response, one pulse later and it would be the same. So what I'm gonna kind of fast forward to give you the idea what I'm gonna try to convince you of is that um, the NMDA receptors are actually, at, after an, one initial release event, they've been converted to a voltage-gated channel they're no longer really a glutamate-gated channel because glutamate is bound and it stays bound a long time. They're just waiting for, the, for a second synaptic event to occur so the AMPA receptors can depolarize the cell and then the NMDA receptors can open. And that actually makes a lot of sense based on what we know about how you have to have high frequency activity, many release events occurring presynaptically in order to induce calcium entry through NMDA receptors and long-term potentiation. So that all makes, that makes sense, really, that, that, the, the, that they're, not in, they're not really coincidence detectors. NMDA receptors are, in a way, they're kind of like phase-shifted responders. They only respond, they respond prim 
predominantly to the second event after the first priming event. So, um, so we wanted to ask what, what, what's the role of glutamate transport in all this to, to, to um, really get to the point of what I, what I want to show you now. The, if, we record, um, if we record a synaptic event, in this case it's an excitatory postsynaptic current in the, in the um, pyramidal neuron, without any magnesium around, we uh, can see that, uh, that there's an EPSC that occurs. So that line is kind of is erased, but the first one is control. The second one that's prolonged is in the presence of this drug called benzyl aspartate, which blocks glutamate transporters. So what, what blocking glutamate transporters does is it prolongs the EPSC, the excitatory postsynaptic current. Now if we and that, we know that's mediated by the NMDA receptors because we can block it completely with this NMDA selective blocker. And notably, the benzyl aspartate, the transport blocker, doesn't do anything to the peak. It doesn't do anything to the AMPA-mediated currents in that EPSC. It's just completely selectively enhancing the NMDA signaling. Now, uh, so this, this kind of an experiment been, was done a long time ago by a number of groups, uh, Craig Jarr and Dimitri Kuhlman, and, and the kind of takeaway message and the dogma in the field at this point is that glutamate transporters rapidly remove glutamate and they help to, con they help to uh, prevent the prolonged activity of NMDA receptors, which, you know, looking at this, that makes sense. The problem with this, it's always bothered me, is that um, in order to see this effect, you have to remove magnesium. You have to record in conditions that allow NMDA receptors to be uh, revealed, and that means getting rid of the magnesium so they can so they can be recorded. But of course, that's not physiologically relevant. There's magnesium present in in neurons in in the brain, and there's dynamic binding and unbinding blocking of uh, magnesium ions during synaptic activity. So we really wanted to look at what happens when you block transport activity under physiological conditions. And to do that, um, we turn to a real simple technique, extracellular recording with a, an electrode that doesn't go into the cell, it doesn't voltage clamp the cell, it just monitors voltage changes in the cell by, uh, by measuring the, the, the field potential surrounding the synapses that are being activated by a, by, a, um, by a stimulus of the presynaptic axons. And what the takeaway message is, is that it's really a boring result, that when you block glutamate transporters with the same concentration that I showed you had a big effect in, in voltage clamp without magnesium, there's really no, uh, no significant effect. So what it means is that, um, does it mean that glutamate transport's not doing anything? Well, you know, no, we know it's doing something because under, when we, when we monitor, explicitly monitor NMDA receptors being activated, we can see that the transporters are uh, restricting how much NMDA receptor activity occurs. But physiologically, it's not doing anything, and we presume it's because magnesium is, is blocking. So, so we wanted to ask, well, you know, based on what I've been showing you um, about the long-lasting priming of the NMDA receptors, if we, if we give another, uh, if, we, if we stimulate twice in quick succession, does that cause some effect on NMDA signaling that we can see? And the answer is, yeah, it does. That if we, if we give two stimuli, to cause glutamate release. You can see there's a, um, a facilitation that's well known, and that's a presynaptic uh, mechanism causing facilitation of the EPSP. But when you, when you block with the transporter blocker, you get this very marked prolongation, and it's also reversed by AP5, by the NMDA receptor blocker. So, that, so what we're saying, what we see is that the inhibition of transport activity doesn't do anything at low frequencies, but it has a big effect on NMDA signaling at high frequencies. 
And we know that at high frequencies, that's really when interesting things happen. That's when you learn. That's when you know, repetitive signaling is occurring with a strong stimulus, a theta burst. Uh, and it's in that, in that kind of signaling uh, uh, protocol that, that LTP occurs. So if we, we wanna, if we look at how, how does this inner stimulus interval duration affect that uh, p selective potentiation of the NMDA response, we can, we can, um, we can plot those, those, those signals. Um, if we do this, if we do this um, stimulus protocol where we give a paired stimulus, we plot the AMPA receptor responses, and we plot the selectively the NMDA res receptor responses, and we can we get these responses by subtracting um, subtracting the this uh, EPSP, taking this EPSP from this EPSP, and that gives us the the NMDA selective response, the component that's blocked by the NMDA selective blocker, and you can see that that's really selectively. Uh, potentiated relative to the AMPA response. And this is a control showing that, that, the, that if we record NMDA receptors responses in the absence of magnesium, the facilitation is the same as the AMPA response. So it's not, this difference isn't due to some kind of kinetic difference or some special property of the NMDA receptors that makes them more facilitated. It's, that's the same. What's, what's important is the, uh, is the paired pulse, is the timing. And um, what we can see is if we plot now, if we plot the, a the AP5, the NMDA receptor field responses, um, the amplitudes overlaying, normalizing and overlaying the AMPA receptor responses, we can see that the, that the NMDA receptor response has a time dependence that we can plot. And that time dependence is about 260, 250 milliseconds. So there's this kind of selective facilitation of the NMDA response. And if you remember the, the plot I showed you a little bit ago, the NMDA receptor channel kinetics look like this. And if we overlay these kinetics with the kinetics of the facilitation of the NMDA receptors, they're, they're uh, almost perfectly matching. So what we think this means is that the, it's actually the channel kinetics of the NMDA receptors that, um, that lead to this, to, this, um, to this facilitation and the time course of that facilitation. And uh, you know, it turned out, thinking about what that meant, that frequency domain is, is really uh, similar to theta oscillations in the hippocampus, which is a well-known um, frequency of activity. It's about, about five hertz or so that we know occurs naturally in hippocampus during sleep, and it's important for learning and memory. And so we think this might underlie, and there's a lot of work that's been done to show why, how theta rhythm occurs, and there's network, complex network activity that causes theta and frequency release of glutamate by networks of excitatory neurons, but the actual reason why theta rhythm itself is so efficacious is at inducing LTP is not known. So we think this might be why. And if we block glutamate transporters, now to circle back and finish that part, um, and we look again at this, at this, the time course of this facilitation of the signal, it turns out that tr blocking transporters greatly prolongs, it smears out that, um, that the, the frequency dependence of induction of, of uh, signaling. So we think what it means is that maybe transporters are preventing glutamate from spreading really far and slowing down um, with the time it takes to reach their postsynaptic targets. If you don't have transport activity, Glutamate can go f much further, and the, the, uh, the effective um, window of time for, for the frequency of activity becomes much slower. So what we think transporters are actually doing, what, what they're maybe one of their, if not the most important thing they do is, in, in, at least in LTP, 
is that they sharpen the time window, the frequency domain for in, the in, induction of LTP. They act like what you would call if you were in circuit analysis, it would be like a high, a high cutoff uh, filter, uh, high frequency filter. And you know, just lastly, this in this part, the the to to bring this back to LTP, if you if you record synaptic um, activity with field recordings, and you give you give um, bursts of stimuli separated by different interburst intervals, you can see that there's a real strong frequency dependence to the amount of LTP that you see. De de higher frequencies of bursts <coughs> give greater degrees of LTP. And that, um, that frequency dependence, now if we go back and overlay that on the patch decay de kinetics of the channels, the synaptic NMDA facilitation, um, and the LTP, uh, they all overlay, so that's, at least it's consistent with the idea that they're all being mediated by the same molecular um, mechanism. Okay, um, now I'm going to quickly switch and finish um, on this newer data, and I'm and I'm going to show you some data that some of it's been published, some of it hasn't been published yet, but I think it's pretty exciting, and I. And I'm confident enough in its um, in how interesting it is to show you some data that's that's not published. But as I as I said, um, NMDA receptors have coagonist sites on NR1 subunits, and that site's been known to. It was first discovered as a glycine site. That glycine was required as a coagonist to, to allow a activation of NMDA receptors in heterologous expression systems. Subsequently, it's been shown by a number of groups, including Saul Snyder's group, that D-serine is uh, synthesized in mammalian brain, and it's actually quite prevalent in mammalian brain. And D-serine can also act at that, at that coagonist site on NR1 receptors. And now, now there's a lot of somewhat still controversial data, but, it's, but it's, I think the consensus in the field is coming around to the idea that D-serine is really quite an important um, endogenous ligand for the glycine, what was called formerly the glycine site of the NMDA receptor. And in fact, in some synapses, in, in cortex and in hippocampus, the evidence is emerging that D-serine is actually the predominant trans co-transmitter, coagonist at that receptor. And there are a lot of uh, NMDA receptor dependent neuropathologies and so consequently, there's a lot of interest in finding new molecular targets to allow manipulation of NMDA receptor activity. And, the, and, this, and this coagonist site is one of them. And one of the ideas that's emerged about schizophrenia over the past decade is that it actually involves a hypofunctioning of glutamate receptors, of NMDA receptors. And there's, there are a number of pilot studies ongoing now to give patients D-serine for schizophrenia, for post-traumatic stress disorder, and there's some indications that it has efficacy, at, for example, relieving negative symptoms of schizophrenia. So despite the importance of D-serine and its emerging kind of recognition as an as a important coagonist, virtually nothing or very, very little is known about D-serine homeostasis. What are the transporters for D-serine? How is D-serine released? Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to convince you that um, we've, we've kind of discovered um, what we think may be the major mechanism by which D-serine transport occurs, sodium-dependent D-serine transport in the brain. Now, um, remember, the glutamate transporter family, the SLC1 family, has seven members, and two of the members are uh, neutral amino acid transporters. And uh, this is just a blow up of the substrate binding site in a glutamate transporter. Based on x-ray crystal structure data, mutagenesis data, glutamate binds in this site here. And I just wanted to focus on this residue here. It's highly conserved in all glutamate transporters. It's an arginine residue in transmembrane domain eight. And uh, 
functional evidence and structural evidence indicates that that residue forms a, an electrostatic pair with the distal carboxylic group of glutamate or NMDA or, uh, or not NMDA, sorry, glutamate or deaspartate. And it turns out that those two, uh, the two members of the family that are neutral amino acid transporters have a mutation here. And that arginine is changed to, uh, to threonine in the case of SLC1A4. So what you can see is if you make a mutation, if you mutate the a human glutamate transporter, changing this arginine residue to threonine, which is found in the neutral amino acid transporter homolog, ortholog, you convert, you convert uh, the um, you convert the uptake activity from an aspartate transporter to a neutral amino acid transporter. And um, so these are actually uh, the, sorry, these are, these are mixed around. This should be R447 in wild type. This is, this is, the, this is the wild type phenotype of, for a glutamate transporter. It transports deaspartate or glutamate, but not neutral amino acids like alanine. When we make this mutation and change it to a threonine, it now transports alanine and not aspartate. Now, um, so this is kind of an example of, a, of an, embarrassing, um, an embarrassing side of science. Because at the time when uh, our group, Susan Amara and, and my group, characterized the, the SLC1A4 transporter, SLC1A4 and A5, we showed that they were neutral amino acid transporters that had characteristics like had been described in biochemical studies for long, long from long ago of neutral amino acid transport activities. Another group, uh, we didn't look at the, we didn't look at uptake of D-serine by those transporters. Another group did express the SLC1A4 transporter and said, reported in JBC that, that it did not transport D-serine. And so subsequent, this was back in the late 90s, and subsequently, for many years, the assumption in the field was that SLC1A4 was not a D-serine transporter. And no one really knew what the D-serine transporters were in brain. There was one uh, sodium-independent D-serine transporter that had been characterized and shown to be expressed in neurons uh, but it didn't seem to mediate uptake, it seemed to mediate release of D-serine. In any event, for, uh, for a number of reasons that will that'll become clear in a second, we decided to go back and look at um, uptake of D-serine by, by SLC1A4, this neutral amino acid glutamate transporter uh, paralog. And it turns out, to make a long story short, it actually does transport D-serine quite well. And you can record currents mediated by the transporter. I'm not going to go through the details of why the, the current polarities are different. Suffice it to say that there's also um, complex anion channel properties associated with these transporters. But they actually transport radio-labeled D-serine. You can see here. Um, this transporter is also called ASCT1, SLC1A4, and it's highly expressed in the brain. And it transports D-serine very effectively. And it has an affinity for D-serine or an apparent affinity, a KM, of uh, about 200 micromolar. We know, we know that uh, we, we started working on this transporter quite a while ago, actually, for different reasons. And it was a collaboration with Sean Esslinger. And we knew that hydroxyproline was a good substrate for this, this, uh, this transporter, ASCT1. And Sean, who was, who, was, who was a medicinal chemist at the University of Montana, developed a whole series of analogs of hydroxyproline based on some um, docking models and homology models that we did. And he, he created, together with his grad student, Brent Lida, a bunch of uh, analogs of hydroxyproline with the idea that they might be good potential tumor inhibitors because, because of the role of this transporter in glutamine transport and its upregulation in a lot of tumors. Um, I'm not, that's another story for another day. I'm not going to talk about its role in cancer. But one of these blockers, we, I'm going to show you some quick data on, 
is a, a biphenyl analog of hydroxyproline. And this is a high affinity blocker of the um, SLC1A4 transporter. You can see when you apply D-serine, you co-apply this blocker and it, and it completely blocks the current induced by D-serine. Um, we can do shield analysis on it. It's a competitive antagonist. Has a, has a Ki of about 128 nanomolar. And it blocks, it blocks uptake of D-serine in brain, which was kind of the, the thing that we wanted to get to right away when, we've dis when we realized it was a D-serine, the ACT1 was a D-serine transporter. If you, if you apply um, this drug in the presence of sodium and you, look, and you measure D-serine transport in, brain, in acute brain slices, it, it um, blocks about half of the D-serine uptake. The other half of the D that's not blocked by the drug is sodium uh, independent. If we remove sodium and replace it with choline, you can see that the bipro, um, bipro the biphenylproline analog, doesn't significantly block that. So there's a, there's a sodium independent component and a sodium dependent component. And um, it's blocking eff effectively all of the sodium dependent component. This sodium independent component I'm not going to talk about because of time, but we think it's due to another transporter. Um, we can express in oocytes, and we can show that, that the drug doesn't, uh, doesn't affect that sodium independent transporter consistent with what we see in brain. So to get to the chase, what, what does this do to signaling in, in brain? Um, if we apply this drug, biphenyl hydroxyproline, to brain slice, and we look, at, uh, we look at LTP in the hippocampus. You can see that um, a, a weak theta stimulus induces LTP. If we add the drug, it's, um, it increases the amount of LTP that's seen. And um, I'm not going to show you because of time uh, data that we have a, a number of other analogs that have different affinities for SLC1A4. Um, and they also, in, they also enhance long-term potentiation. And the affinities of these, of these um, analogs is correlated. The affinity, their efficacy at enhancing LTP is correlated with their efficacy at blocking the transporter. Now, um, just as we were um, doing these experiments last year, there were, there were three studies that came out almost simultaneously, um, exome sequencing projects that associated a mutation in SLC1A4 with uh, a syndrome that involved intellectual disability, microcephaly, spasticity. So it was a developmental and cognitive, profound cognitive deficit in children that had this, this mutation in SLC1A4. And, you, and uh, it's not totally um, clear, but if you, if, if imaging studies of the, of the affected individuals showed that they had um, a lot of structural deficits that were consistent with um, developmental delay. And we know, of course, that NMDA receptors are involved in, um, they're involved in brain development in addition to l learning and memory because Activity of NMDA receptors is required to establish synaptic connections at early stages in brain development. Now, when these papers came out, uh, the, there was nothing known about the role of this transporter in deserine uptake. And so the, all, all three of the papers speculated that there was some kind of a neutral amino acid deficiency in, in the brain that um, led to these disorders. And so, but it's really not clear how that, how that might work, um, especially since the, um, some of the functional studies of the mutation indicated that it wasn't a, it wasn't, um, a complete knockout, it wasn't a loss of function mutation. It did appear to decrease the maximum amount of transport activity um, compared to wild type, this is the mutant, and the mutation is 256, glutamate 256 to lysine. 
Um, there was a slight increase in the apparent affinity, but a decrease in the um, maximum maximum uptake. So we, we'd say the the Vmax was reduced, the KM was um, smaller. And is this in the amino acid binding site? Close. It's not. It's actually in a region that's um, kind of far away. It's in a it's in a region that's n it's not obviously clear what it's doing, or how it's working. That's something we want to we're working on right now. So we we actually are now collaborating with the group. And that to answer your question, the mutation is here. Um, this is a this is going to be. I'm going to show you a real brief movie of how the transporter works. So you can see there's kind of an elevator domain and and a, and a what's called a trimerization domain that's relatively inflexible that mediates contacts between the three subunits. Glutamate, or, or in this case, deserine binds up here where this, this loop here is. It closes on the substrate, it goes down, and it's pr then presumably released in, in the cell. Um, and the mutation is in this region here. So we were speculating that it may be that there's some kind of a structural change in this helix, helix 5, that uh, is impacting either the kinetics or something about this about this functional movement. And do they get this out of MD simulation or is this just an animation? This is just an animation we made. It's, it's actually just uh, it's a it's a um, morph based on three structures right. that are known. Right. Yeah, right. yeah. So, but what we did, what we saw then, that was actually kind of interesting and thought is provoking now, and we're, we're trying to figure out what this means. You, the, it's, it's clear that, that the maximum amount of deserine uptake is reduced by that mutation, but the apparent affinity of the transporter for deserine is higher. So it's as though it can more effectively bind it, but, it, but, but as you saturate it with high concentrations, it can't go as fast. But but so really what I'm saying is it's going to kind of boil down to the devil being the details of the concentrations of deserine in the brain that are being ambiently mediated, being ambiently controlled. And um, when, if we look at the effect of this mutation on, high concent on low concentrations of deserine, uh, in this case it's 100 nanomolar deserine, which is actually uh, not too far from what it may be physiological deserine concentrations. There's a lot more, there's almost double the amount of transport compared to the wild type. So we think that, we're, we think that the, the, the possibility that this mutation might be in, in effect a gain of function mutation that's causing a reduction in extracellular deserine, which could have consequences for uh, NMDA signaling. Because we know that adding deserine or blocking the deserine transporter or scavenging it, I didn't show you that data, with enzymes that degrade deserine can um, raise or lower NMDA receptor signaling levels and consequently um, LTP. So um, just to recapitulate what I've, what I've, what I've said, um, surprisingly, SLC1 transporters are, are a, a kind of a diverse family now. We know there, there is glutamate transporters and there are neutral amino acid transporters. And it turns out that they both, both members of both of those functional classes converge on uh, uh, modulating NMDA receptor signaling. And um, the, 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 the glutamate receptors primarily, we think we have some new data that suggests that one of their main roles is in modulating the frequency dependence of signaling and how the how f how transport makes a sharp uh, high pass filter cutoff for frequency, so you have to have high frequency activity occurring to induce LTP. And the uh, the deserine transporter side of the family. Um, first of all, we think it is really a bona fide deserine transporter and is maybe maybe a a predominant mechanism for deserine um, homeostasis in brain. And we think that it's the inhibition, the modulation of activity of that deserine transporter can modulate 
NMDA receptor activity and long-term potentiation with consequences when it's mutated for, for uh, cognitive and developmental um, deficits. So, sorry I went over a little bit longer than I, than I wanted to, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. I just want to first quickly go through some of the students and postdocs, Wayne on, um, who did a lot of the work with, with Katie on uh, synaptic plasticity and effects by glutamate transporters, and uh, Jill and Jenny, who've been working on the um, deserine transport activity in the NMDA receptor, I mean, in the uh, SLC1A4 transporter. And uh, Matthias Hediger uh, in the group that did, was involved in the exome, signal, exome project to sh um, isolate this mutation. I didn't say that that, I forgot to mention that that, um, that mutation in SLC1A4 that causes deserine transport changes is actually highly prevalent in Ashkenazi Jewish populations about up to, there is an estimate now that about 0.7% of the Ashkenazi Jewish population are carriers of that allele. So um, understanding the me molecular mechanism of this, this mutation and maybe developing some therapeutic strategies for it are, uh, are of great interest and importance. So thanks a lot for your attention.